Welcome, everybody, to the Gate Expectations podcast, where I bring in a weekly guest, talk all things Yu-Gi-Oh!, and get to know a little more about each person I talk to. This is the only Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast that is run by a full-fledged journalist such as myself. This is episode 12. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can check out earlier podcasts with guests like Stephen Trifonoski, Jesse Cotton, Team Samurai X1, Doug Zeef, Cody Angeloff, and many more. My guest for this week has a YouTube channel with over 11,000 subscribers. He is a multiple YCS topper and the master of decklist and combos. Also a very good friend of mine. It's Yassine Sali, a.k.a. Yassine656. Yassine, man, thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. Hey, thank you for inviting me here in the first place. Thank you so much. How are you doing, brother? I am doing really well, buddy. I had a lot of chores to do today, and then I had to do a lot of prep work to get ready to talk to you today. I hope you had a good day as well. I feel you. Yeah, and I had a I had a pretty huge day, and I started sleeping at like 2, so I had to wake up at like 8.40 to, for like a day that starts at 9. This is the cool thing that I like about the situation right now since we work at home. So. Yeah. I can I can afford to like wake up last minute and <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's it's honestly it, it's it makes the day go like go by like much smoother and yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the exact same way. I, I'm the person who likes to sleep in as much as possible before they have to get up and go to work. And, you know, since I'm a journalist, I get to just sit at home. So I'll just sleep until whatever I'm ready to start working and then I just go at it. So I love doing that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun, man. Awesome. Yeah. All right, man. So, so we talked about your YouTube channel, man. Over eleven thousand subscribers, man. A, a lot of, a lot of deck lists, a lot of uh, combo videos, as you show them, man. That's uh, tell me a lot more about what your what happens at your YouTube channel. Well, okay. So to be completely fair, uh, when I met Etipat. So Team Samurai X1 for people who don't actually know his name. Yep. I don't think I had a lot of subscribers. I had like 1,500, I think, and I wasn't uploading seriously. And mm -hmm. most of my like old views and subscribers were like RuneScape and Pokemon subscribers <laughs> because that those those were the kind of videos that I was making. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I like a RuneScape guy that has like 150K views and none <laughs> of my Yu-Gi-Oh! videos can get like over like 20K or 30K. It's crazy. <laughs> but uh, it's just... Like he like reignited the flame inside of me to make <laughs> videos again because it was something that I already like kind of had. It. And I don't know, like it was just like, do you need um? He, he was basically like, can you help me with this deck? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do it. And then I just started uploading like my own combo videos and it was just like enjoyable for me because I was getting like feedback from other people. So I was learning while letting other people's like other people learn and it's mm -hmm. like a win-win situation and mm -hmm. then it eventually became something of okay you know what i'm actually going to kind of transform this into something serious and <laughs> uh, i started uploading more often and mm -hmm. when the virus actually uh like uh you know like became a thing mm -hmm. uh what i started to do is i just stopped completely like completely playing Yu-Gi-Oh for real mm -hmm. i was just spending too much time playing games on Edio Pro Ignis and not really doing anything productive with my life. I was just, it, it was just a very like, um, I don't know how to say it in English, like uh, the routine life, you know, uh, how do you, how do you say that? Routine life. Yeah, basically. It, yeah, it was just, it was just the exact same thing every single day, you know, wake mm -hmm. up, go to school, get back home, play some games on Edio Pro Ignis, go to sleep and like watch some movies, go to sleep rinse and repeat it's just super boring and youtube videos when i started making them seriously i was just like mm -hmm. oh i missed out on so much and yeah. then i kind of like adopted like a mindset of you know what i did so many mistakes i want to start making videos to like kind of help people not repeat the mistakes that i've made or mm -hmm. at least let them know that if they are doing something wrong that it is a mistake and they shouldn't actually continue on this path but mm -hmm. on this path sorry, and actually go on another path that is actually just uh, more productive and will make you just like a better i guess better person better player sometimes mm -hmm. it's just uh just about like changing your mindset for life mm -hmm. like indirectly 
to a good, like a better Yu-Gi-Oh player as well. And mm-hmm. ever since like, the uh, April 18th, I have been uploading consistently daily videos on my mm-hmm. channel, 100% non-stop. There has mm-hmm. not been a single day since April 18th that I haven't not uploaded a video. So, yeah. Yeah, so first of all, you're looking for like uh, what we call, we're saying English because I know it's not your first language, but it's, we call it yeah, a, a yeah. monotonous lifestyle. Monotonous, it's like repeated, ah, repetitive, there, there. Yeah. really boring. I think that was the word you're looking for, uh, number one. And then number exactly. two, yeah, I, I know you started doing uh, your videos roughly about two years ago, and I know I was I was part of it once when I went to go visit you up at a, at a Montreal regional, but that's where you really started to take off because I know you put like one video about four years ago, you put like an Inferno deck profile, didn't really do touch your YouTube two videos until another two years later and then all of a sudden you just started to explode and everything's just looking better and better after every video i've watched off you like your production's getting better and you know and it looks a lot better and you know you're more comfortable with yourself in front of the camera yo thank you so much actually because i really appreciate it because it's also like um it's just like an indicator that I'm doing something good, but at the same time, I want to keep improving like and going like this uh, this way because mm-hmm. it's just, uh, you know, I'm getting something off like off of this you know mm-hmm. even if i just don't play Oh anymore i learned so much off of just like the youtube production like mm-hmm. part of it like you know like camera being uh, one really huge very over um uh sorry uh overrated no underrated underrated thing oh, yeah. about yeah. all of that is the is like this the social aspect and also the fact that you get to become like more spontaneous when you film yourself in front of a camera. Like when I started, I was super like awkward. And now I just, I can even like talk to people in real life better because yep. I like words just come like to, to my mind, like a, a little bit faster, I guess. Like sometimes obviously, you know, even when um, like, for example, right now when I'm talking, I'm talking in English, so I still have to think a bit, but yep. I don't know. It's just uh, something really cool. And I kind of developed a passion for like filmmaking. So in the future, I kind of want to start, I don't know, like start vlogging, start um, just recording really cool, like uh, scenery and stuff like that. Make uh, <laughs> nice editings uh, in like Adobe Premiere. I just mm-hmm. I just want to like discover new things. And it's just something that this game has actually allowed me to do. Because one thing that I actually like say a lot is that i think that Yu-Gi-Oh is not a card game it's more of like an experience like the card game is a very small percentage of what Yu-Gi-Oh stands for mm-hmm. and a lot of people they, they they just don't really care about it they just see Yu-Gi-Oh. okay you play cards you go back home you try to deck build a bit or you net deck mm-hmm. if you don't want to do the work mm-hmm. and then you just play more you go to regionals and then you go to ICS if you want but Nah, it's it's so much deeper than that. And I, I know you obviously you have so you have way more experience than me. So uh, I want to know what, what is actually your take on the like Yu-Gi-Oh as a whole. It definitely is a, a, just uh, more than just a game for sure. 100 percent. It's definitely a big experience. I was going to touch up on you with this when you said that, because I wholeheartedly agree with you, because without Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, I mentioned this with so many guests before. I, I wouldn't be able to get to travel as to many places I wouldn't. I wouldn't have seen as many friends, met as many friends as I would have. And right now, my best friend, he plays, he doesn't play Yu Gi Oh anymore, but I met him through Yu Gi Oh, and we've been best friends since uh, 2008. And we've had a really good friendship. And we go to Los Angeles every year as a best friends trip. So we're really close with each other. And, this, and then, same with you, too, you, you and me, because we have a very good friendship with each other as well. And when you and I talk, we always have a laugh. It's always really positive, and we always get great matches with each other. We face each other three times, and each one has been really enjoyable. And I've I've loved dueling you on all three of those matches. So, yeah. And again, there's there's so many other things as well. Like there's also like the business aspect of being able to buy and sell cards. That's something I like to do a lot. I love to do trading because it also again it helps me meet other people. And, it, you know, to a smaller extent, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! likes to use a lot of, like, more advanced and really strange words. And I, it kind of builds my vocabulary a little bit, too. And I tell that for any parents that want to get their children to play. It does help build that, uh, your vernacular vocabulary. The, the words you say, you get to know a lot more. And it, it really helps with that as well. But I think there's a lot of good skills that come out of just playing this game. And it's definitely a different experience for sure. Without it, my life would be completely different. I 10 billion percent agree. Like it actually builds character and it kind of, 
it, it makes you discover like like more passions like it it makes you realize that you have talents in something for example like when i just started playing you like Yu Gi Oh again back in 2014 mm -hmm. after like yeah. a really long break mm -hmm. uh i just I just never really had uh, too much uh, self-confidence. And then I realized, oh, wait, hold on. I can deck build and it's just so cool. So yeah. even when I wasn't too great, it was just something very enjoyable. And eventually after doing it for so long, yeah. I eventually became like decent at it. So I was just like, oh, wait, hold on. I can actually like create my own deck, bring it to an event and actually expect to do well, even if that deck was 100% unexplored. And <laughs> I think where people might actually start to see where I'm going is when I actually came up with a really insane, really unorthodox Cyber Dragon deck. That was, that that caught everyone off guard because mm -hmm. who the hell would actually like ever believe that a trap version of Cyber Dragon with only one copy mm -hmm. of Cyber Dragon <laughs> would yeah. ever be able to top eight a YCS. <laughs> It's <laughs> like, what would, like, did you actually believe in it? <laughs> Yeah, that, that would be really tough. But I like uh, what you said about how this game builds character. Uh, I'll ask you this question first. Like, do, do you play any sports or uh, did you play any sports when you were growing up? Uh, honestly, I, the, 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 I, I swear, the, and I'm not making this up. I yeah. never really had any self-confidence to play any sports. So okay. uh, the first time I realized that I actually was good in something was at the age of, I think, 15 or 16, when mm -hmm. I realized that actually ran uh, fast because the thing is my cardio is garbage because mm -hmm. i have fast muscular fibers so yep, same uh, here. it's kind of like a trade-off yeah exactly so bad cardio uh really good f uh, really good uh, speed and really good strength that's kind of like what i had so i inherited that from my father but not from my mother because she actually used to run a uh, cross country mm -hmm. and uh at the age of 16 it was my like second to last year of high school and it's sad because i kind of just realized the um, like that skill of mine a bit too late and then i realized that after that even if i trained hard some people actually they they worked on their like skill were like so much before me yeah. um that it was just uh, i i couldn't like catch up to to the really crazy uh like sprinters out there i was doing like a hundred meter dash and okay. 200 meter but i wasn't like spectacular you know i was like for the 100 meter i did 12.13 but i wasn't like training you know too often and other people were like in the 11.7 seconds so i was just like you know what forget it i i i, I can't uh, i can't be that so eventually i just started you know what uh, i have to do something with my life i can't just stay like skinny fat my entire life so i started hitting the gym and it was just it, it was like a passion like in like on its own so it's it's really cool because kind of just like Yu-Gi-Oh it helps you on other things in your life mm -hmm. because it makes you just in a better mood it makes you in a better shape of course obviously that's the main like goal and mm -hmm. it also creates goals like instead of being like oh you know what I'm just gonna do it because uh whatever I want to just like not uh, like look weird it's just like oh you know what i'm gonna try to bench this next time and mm -hmm. uh i'm, I'm gonna try to look like that and then i don't know it's just uh it, it was just something that i i really liked a lot and now i actually came back from like this is my fourth year mm -hmm. since the virus situation and even mm -hmm. before i wasn't too working often but now this is only my fourth week and i managed to gain like most of my strength back i can mm -hmm. bench two plates uh Again, like not not too not too hard. So I'm really mm -hmm. happy actually. I, I like it so much. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I, I want to ask you this because you know when you do sports or like, and I guess weightlifting also counts as well. You know, you're doing it on your own, like especially with solo sports. You can't really blame it on anyone else. You only have yourself to blame. So that's a way of, of building character. So when you're going out to work out, you're, you're it's self discipline, it's uh, perseverance, and just being able to get into that routine to be able to go out and work out all the time. And it's kind of like here with Yu Gi Oh as well. You know, when you're out there, it's really hard to blame other people. You know. You, you know yeah when you look at it uh as a whole you you don't 
don't want to blame like other people for for your loss. So obviously you can maybe blame your opponent because they're they're trying to make you lose. But in the end, you know, you have to kind of look at yourself and look, look where you did wrong, and then and that's how you grow and get better. And I think that's kind of like a good parallel when you kind of work out that that's your own discipline, that's yourself giving yourself confidence, and that's the same with the way with it is with Yu-Gi-Oh on how to get better is being able to look at yourself and help make yourself better rather than you know going out and blaming on anyone else because it's ultimately it's you that's doing all of this yeah 100 percent. by the way mental strength is stronger than physical strength that's that's what i believe in and uh <laughs> like the thing with Yu Gi Oh is that it's it's just that it was normalized for people to say oh yeah but uh oh i lost because of that 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 instead of actually trying to like learn from their like mistake and try to see their mistake actually that's the hardest part yeah. and honestly i had that problem until like 2019 like, realistically, I don't want to pretend like I was a good sport for, like, most of my life because I was just, like, between 2016, I want to say, to 2019, mm -hmm. I was very stubborn, very, like, way too competitive, not really, didn't really have, like, a healthy attitude. And mm -hmm. then YCS Chicago 2019 is what made me kind of just realize, oh, wow, I did so many things wrong, so many things wrong, mm -hmm. because I remember a game against a guru player where I, like... On a on a game two, I had a hand that could actually make the Kali Yuga combo. That was back in uh, that was back when Rusty was uh, unbanned. I mean, it's it's back to being unbanned. Yep. I, I don't know why they did it, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, when Rusty was a thing. People didn't even know about Kali Yuga. It was very 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 new. Uh, we were like five players out of like ten, like two thousand to play Kali Yuga, and basically, uh, the thing is. Uh, sorry, yeah, my hand was good enough to make Kali Yuga, but I had to do something so incredibly weird that my, like, I, and it was just like, it was something like Wisdom Eye and Wisdom Eye pop pop, and then like scale a Black Fang, scale a Dragon, like Dragon Pit, and then mm -hmm. discard a Pendulum from my hand to like pop my Black Fang, revive back a Pendulum, like the Pendulum that I just discarded, then normal summon a, like something, make a Lectrum. And then, you know, I can turbo out Electrum before my pen summon because if you have to make Electrum after your Pendulum summon, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're, you're like, the, the, like your turn's over at this point. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I was just, I was so tilted at the fact that I lost that I couldn't really learn anything from it. And then, you know what? I actually learned my mistake while I was make, like having a flashback in the, in the air, like in the mm -hmm. airplane, like mm -hmm. in my flight back home, I was just like, I was... I was such like, I was so on tilt that I I was just like okay I have to like, like look like take a look back at all of my games. Why did I lose? Could I have won with my hand? And could I have won with better deck building? Mm -hmm. And I realized yes, indeed, I actually could have won with better deck building, and mm -hmm. I could have won with better like skill and execution. And mm -hmm. ever since that, uh, it's kind of like the mentality that I started to apply to pretty much every event. I mean. I'm saying that as if we had like 10 billion events. Come on. We had <laughs> we had, we had Nats uh, 2019 and then YCS Portland and then YCS Niagara. And all three events, I swear on my life, I was on a super like significantly better mood even when I was losing because it, it was just like a question of mindset. It was just like, oh, I lost. I, I know I could have done better. It's not even like, oh, I lost. Oh, that's BS. I, sh I should have won, man. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, okay. I know I could have done better. And realistically, my opponents actually did something right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that the, the Niagara was also a very good lesson. for. Uh, sorry. Um, NAWCQ 2019 was a very good lesson for me. Portland, I decided to not play Danger Thunder because, uh, by the way, I was undefeated for eight rounds straight at Nats 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. then, yeah, YCS Portland... I played Cyber Dragons. My two losses were to the deck that I thought would be the least problematic, which was mm -hmm. Salamandrate. And once mm -hmm. again, I got punished for being cocky. It's just like an attitude kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, that, that deck is an easy matchup. All I have to do is like contact fuse and my traps should allow me to survive. But mm -hmm. no, because I was getting like rage roared and twinned and it was just like very horrible. And it, like I should have should have considered the worst case scenario a bit more. And now mm -hmm. that's once again, something else that I've started adding to my mentality is you should not, you should never like deck build to consider like an average case scenario or a good case scenario, because mm -hmm. 
the the scariest thing that can happen to you is a worst case scenario so you have to prepare yourself for that and someone actually commented on one of my videos saying your deck is just as good as your worst hand and i 200 agree with that like if your mm -hmm. worst hand is like is horrible then your deck is probably horrible because you might actually draw like those bad hands like very often but mm -hmm. if your worst hand is actually like you can play it out eventually mm -hmm. it's not that bad like you can just you can actually start um making your deck like more um like you can add some form of strategy and actually choose better utility cards like mm -hmm. dino wrestler pancreatops for example it's not just a card that actually beats the opponent it's actually like a stability card it's a monster on the field and mm -hmm. on top of having like an option to destroy a card on your turn mm -hmm. it can also interrupt the opponent uh, like during their turn so that card is like like you know like a you like an option, but then there's Zooking Alpha where you're like, oh, it's just another Pankratops. I'm just going to play three because unlike Pankratops, you can play three. But mm -hmm. then you realize it's not an interruption and it has flaws because you can't really summon it if your opponent has no monsters or if the total attack is, you know, like lower or if they just have a face down monster. So mm -hmm. it also has flaws. And you got to be aware of every single flaw of a card before analyzing its strength. And that's mm -hmm. something that I, I just keep learning like very small details like that, but mm. another and not even from uh, Yu-Gi-Oh actually. So, you know, mm. the correlation between Yu-Gi-Oh and actual real life mm. is that in order to achieve 80% of the results, you only need to put in 20% of the effort, which mm. is the easy part, right? We, if you want to have like an 80% in your exam, you don't even need to do that much work. However, the, like the like the part that makes you a winner is the difference between an 80% and 100%. And in order to get that only 20%, you have to put in 80% of the effort, which is gigantic. So you have to work day and night in order to beat some people who are literally on the almost same level as you. And you have to think of the very small details because at this point, you only you already mastered the, ba you already mastered the basics. So <laughs> what can you really like you know achieve more you all you can do is actually just try to think of the psychological aspect of Yu-Gi-Oh very like uh in-depth hyper geometric distributions in order to deck build as efficiently as possible mm -hmm. you have to start learning your opponent's decks instead of just yours because mm -hmm. what makes you a good player with your own deck is the ability to actually play your opponent's deck better mm -hmm. than they do and actually mm -hmm. kind of like predict the future in a way so you know th th there are just so many dimensions to deck building and it's also a passion and i want to share it to everyone in the entire world and instead of actually like promoting um an innovator to consumer mentality i want everyone to become the innovator themselves i want people to become deck builders deck builders them themselves so yeah. that's why i don't encourage people to net deck because net decking is something with very uh, low, uh short term advantages mm -hmm. it's like the kind of thing that you can do when you're coming back into the game or when you're just starting mm -hmm. but if you're actually net decking to play the deck in events i think you already start the event by losing mm -hmm. so i don't know what you think of all that but i think i talk too much <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's kind of like the the mentality of let, let's say you put like a two men with a sword with the same sword and you have like the best person with the sword they already know how to use their weapon well but if you give somebody who's just kind of just copying their sword and all their gear they may not yield the same result because you know it's it's more of the wielder than it is the sword and then that's that's kind of like yeah. the same parallel here with the Yu-Gi-Oh deck sure it's the same deck but you might not get the same results because of the person who's piloting the deck yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I know in like con. Mm. No, go ahead. Go, go ahead. for it. Okay. Well, I, mean, I, I, was I know in like control. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I know in like control uh, mirror matches, people say it's usually like more uh, skill based. In reality, I feel like most of the skill, anyways, comes from deck building because if you if you just keep saying like, oh yeah, it's just not as good, then it's only like due to like two and a half things it's due to i guess luck because there is a luck percentage it's due to the fact that you played cards that weren't really good in the matchup so it's on you for deck building and then i guess the other like 0.5 is you maybe not doing the perfect decisions because what cost me top eight of the ycs was me not playing absolutely 100 percent perfectly because i actually i breaked both games by the way i did not draw core i did not uh I didn't draw core any game in my top eight. So mm -hmm. it was horrible, actually. My game two hand, I wanted to just throw my hand 
people and just give a handshake to my opponent because I, I couldn't actually do any life play and he drew very good. But once mm -hmm. again, uh, it's like in hindsight, I, I think I could have avoided like all of that. So, well, it's, it's also like side decking is also a, a really big thing in Yu Gi Oh as well because you're playing with your main deck only once and then you're, your side deck, you're playing with two completely different decks at this point because of how many cards you're shuffling in. And people don't realize how big a deal side decking is, especially with the deck building, because you're at that point, you're kind of taking away some consistency to be able to stop your opponent a little bit more. And that's where like a little bit of the grind game comes in. And a lot of players. Uh, nowadays that weren't uh, like legacy players before don't know how to play the grind game very well, which gets a little bit more tricky in, uh, at that point in time. So people realize that, you know, you know, deck building is not just your deck. It's also your extra deck and your main and your side deck as well, because that's also deck building in itself. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. It, I, I actually 100% agree. Like the side deck is super, super powerful because sometimes people can't actually like predict your side deck. They can predict your main deck because to a certain extent, every deck looks similar. Like for example, the Adam Ancipator deck, like the only variance would be like, oh, do you, does he play like Tackle Crusader and the weird uh, doll that actually, that's like a tuner that special summons itself. And those just like, you know, like the Quacky Maru supplier cards like that. But the mm -hmm. side deck, it can literally be anything. And mm -hmm. then it's really scary because you're like, uh oh, if I go first, I can get and he can full combo on me but if mm -hmm. i go second and i don't draw my good cards then he can full combo on me i don't know mm -hmm. what he's playing it's just it's very tricky actually yeah it absolutely is very tricky and it's funny how we've kind of had like an evolution of side decking as well where every single card matters is like for example well, way back when even if you i knew i was going to go second i would still side in some traps anyway even though i couldn't use them the first turn i know that, that the game will last several turns that i can use the trap cards eventually but nowadays when i play Yu-Gi-Oh, i don't want to side in trap cards knowing knowing if i'm going to go second unless i can use them first turn because they're going to be a dead card with the way how the game is you know so like side decking gets so different nowadays and it's such a, it's such a different skill set that people don't realize that you know if you don't know how to side deck well you know you're probably going to lose uh, almost uh, like you know at least half your games i want to add something to something like to something you just said right now yeah, like the, the like the the trap cards when you side them going second i i do agree with you it makes like almost no sense to side them in but there was one situation for me where siding a trap going second actually made more sense than siding it going first. And mm -hmm. that situation, you're probably going to laugh and you're going to be confused, was <laughs> Deck Devastation Virus in Cyber Dragons against Salamangrate. Try to think about it for 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I'm trying to think. Cyber Because I, I can't remember. Why would I think it, Infinity, why, is yeah. Infinity and Nova, they're light, they're light still, aren't they? They're light, yeah. Why, why would I side Deck Devastation Virus going second against Salamangrate? Yeah, because they've already built their they've built their board in this case, and majority of their and their field is going to be above fifteen hundred. So you've got me right now offhand. Okay, so literally any cyber dragon monster plus trap trick or deck devastation virus makes them lose their like entire follow up. So I'm going to contact fuse, and then Mega Fleet is going to jump over something and that's going to make them lose their veilings. And wow. then I'm going to set my deck devastation virus, and Mega Fleet is a dark monster with a lot of attack. So during their turn, I can use it, make them lose the gazelle follow-up that they have and every monster on their field. And their their monsters have very low attack, so they can't play anymore. So wow. it's just a really cool way with only two cards built in in your engine because you're always going to have a dark, even though you don't main deck a single dark monster. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of situation where your opponent actually gave you the dark monster. But uh, it's actually really interesting. Once again, another thing that you said is that you don't want to play going second cards that are just unplayable going first. So I actually incorporated another strategy in my Cyber Dragon deck to counter Salamangrade, where if I actually had to go first and I drew deck Devastation Virus, what I would do is if I had an ab like the ability to summon two monsters on the field, I would actually contact Fuse myself for Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon, which ah. is a dark monster with exactly 2,000. So I can use it for deck devastation virus and i'm playing six deck devastation virus so the odds of being able to completely destroy salamangrid were very high and you have no idea the amount of games that i stole with this card i can believe it and i'm glad uh you didn't do that to me at all even though i wasn't like solomon great but i can play sky strikers <laughs> at least and I'm, I'm glad you didn't do that to me when we played each other last time when i was in montreal I oh. 
I got destroyed. It wasn't even close. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we played together. We played each other three times. And the first yeah. time we played each, against each other, it was uh, Zodiac versus Infernoid. And it looked like I was yeah. going to win the match. I was, looks like I was going to give a big 2-0 on you. Yes. And then all of a sudden, yeah. I overextended, fell into Forbidden Apocrypha. Oh, sorry. And, and then you just took over. And then I had nothing left because I ran out of steam. And then and the exactly next time... That. Yeah, it's exactly that. I got see, I got overzealous at that point. I got uh, not a little cocky, a little arrogant. There's something that you did that if you just there, you, you were in a position where not doing anything was better than doing something. So you had Fossil Dyna, and I just simply could not out it. And all you had to do was just keep attacking with Fossil Dyna when I would have lost. But you yeah. summoned the monster. I think I torrential tribute you, and yes, then that's, that's how right. you lost your Fossil Dyna. Yeah, because I wasn't expecting torrential tribute in that deck. That caught me by that caught me off guard, which is why why yeah. I lost that it, one. Exactly. And you yeah. know, like deck building and just playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in general is about trying to play around the most amount of cards in the, like as possible. But like that, that just sounds so easier to like said than done. It's so hard to like predict every card. You you kind of have to feel like you're in a position where you have to like you're like you're always trying not to lose instead of winning. I don't know. You're always being like, how can I lose this game instead of how can I win it? Because you're winning a game by default. Like that's the mentality of a champion. Mm -hmm. But you're trying not to lose. And if I overcommit, I lose because I get blown out by one trap. But if I do, I feel if I play it safe, then I can't get blown out because I'm not losing too much and I can recover. So. Mm -hmm. And that's a funny thing for me is because I kind of use that mentality for myself. I always think of my opponent is always going to make the best play. They'll all, always be prepared for the best play. That's how I always think. So I assume that everyone's going to make all the good plays and everything. Like that, and I have to learn how to play around it. And if somehow that they're not making the best play, then I get maybe it's a little lucky on my end. Or I just learn how to really grind very well against it. It's it's kind of funny, but it really makes me focus. And and I don't underestimate anybody when I have that kind of mentality. Yeah, yeah pre prepare yourself for the worst, but expect like a, a hope for the best. Yes, that's that's a great way of putting it. And that's definitely how I think when I uh, play the game. And there was another thing I wanted to touch on uh, back of what you said with your long little spiel there. Um, when it comes to when you said playing other people, playing other people's decks like against your own, uh, I, I really like that idea because it's a tip that I like to tell um, lesser players on uh, how to get better. Is if you know, look at your opponent's board right now. Like even just looking at their board and knowing what they have in their hand, like think of the play that they could do on you right now, and that can they win out of that, or can they put you in a really hurting situation? And oh, that's and that's a really good way of uh, you know making having some foresight or being able to make your move because if you know at least what your opponent can do on the next turn, then you got to be able to prepare yourself for that if you can't kill them that turn. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Like for example, just underest like understanding like a combo and how it goes and like how the deck is built. It allows you to use your interruptions better and do the like the the best plays. Like there is something that I I can say right now. If I have to go first against an Alter Geist player, for example, even if I have Cyber Dragon Core and some like an ability to make like Infinity or something. Ironically, as hilarious as this may sound, I don't do anything. I don't even summon core. I don't even go core search emergency, which technically would have been a free plus one. But the reason why I don't do that is because I expect the worst case scenario, which is my opponent has infinite faker. And as sad as this may seem, it's still a 10% chance of happening. So there is a 10% chance of me instantly losing. So what I do is that I don't put any cards face up on the field to bluff the lightning storm so they never overcommit, and then I can eventually kill them. Oh, so you got to use a little bit of psychology as well, which I, which I like as, which, and also miss as part of the game as well since we can't really play in person. I love the psychological aspect of playing the game. It's so fun. Yeah, it's terrifying. Like, especially when there are blowout cards like Lightning Storm that you can kind of play around. Same thing with like Mystic Mine. You're like, oh, this sounds fishy, man. He can Mystic Mine me at any point and I'm just going to lose. Yeah. Harpy's Feather Duster, unfortunately, is kind of like the exception to the rule because you cannot predict it. You cannot really play around it too much. Like, they can have a full board and then Lightning, like Harpy's Feather Duster next turn and you're going to be like, okay, whatever. Just sure, you you, you got this. Mm -hmm. It's it's unfortunate, but... uh. It just doesn't have too many restrictions, I guess, too many conditions. Yeah, and that was a big surprise for that card coming back, although we, a lot of people were kind of motioning for it to be back because we already had it in the OCG, 
and we just haven't got it yet in the in the TCG, and it also it helps support one of those uh, the Harpy Trap card that lets you search it afterwards, which I know a couple Harpy players are really happy and thrilled to have that card back. But yeah, Harpy's Feather Duster is going to be really different because this is the first time we're actually seeing it come off the list. And we and you know a lot of players don't know really how to deal with it or got to figure out how we're going to deal with Harpy's Feather Duster or even if we're going to main deck it at this point. Yeah, Harpy's Feather Duster is that kind of card that if you main deck and you're going first deck, you're just playing another blank in your deck. So uh, it's kind of weird, but at the same time, I know some people were main decking Dark Ruler no more in their deck because they were like, my deck is so consistent and can play already very well. So I might as well just deck build in like a uh, in in a way to actually beat everyone. Like if if I lose the dice roll, I can still play. And if I win the dice roll, well, I already can already can play no problem. But <laughs> then you have blanks in your hand, and if you get a hand shopped, then you have one less card to work with. So <laughs> it, it always creates like um like a paradox where you're never a winner because there's always something that you're missing out on. And this is like <laughs> the crazy, like the crazy huge, like 10 dimension of deck building is that you can never truly be perfect. Like, your deck can't really have everything. And if, if the perfect deck existed, it wouldn't be perfect because everyone, <laughs> everyone would be playing it. And then uh, the deck would actually suck because <laughs> uh, it would actually, like, people would, would only counter, like, like deck build the deck to counter its like itself like pe like mm -hmm. people would for example like the zodiac mirror deck a uh, mirror match it was just like i play as many anti zodiac cards as possible so people were like okay sure since you're playing anti zodiac zodiac i'm just gonna play true draco with card of demise mm -hmm. and uh, just tribute over a trap summon dynamite to destroy your drancia oh okay you chain i'll chain my own monster and then i summon masterpiece oh Oh, uh, you deck built to beat Zodiac and not true Draco. You can't out a masterpiece. I guess I, I guess I win. Mm -hmm. And I guess, oh, yeah. was that the same? Was that the same mentality you had when we when we played each other the first time we met at that auto regional? No, no, was, no, 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 no. I, I was definitely not as, I guess, as deep and as just uh, developed. Honestly, I, I, I think 2019. Like I said, the I, I had just a huge streak of loot, just mm -hmm. like the best thing that could have happened to me. And like after that, it kind of like became just better. Yeah, because at that point, like you had uh, you had this streak of events that you went to. You said to, it was Portland. Uh, I forget the one that you said before, and then there was Niagara Falls after, which was the event that you yeah. talked with Cyber Dragons. Which uh, you know it wasn't a very popular choice. I knew Cyber Dragon Orcust was a possibly a thing, but Cyber Dragons wasn't the most popular choice out there at the time. Yeah, but Cyber Dragon was like sleeper best deck. It's just that nobody actually really, really played it and nobody really just believed in it. Cyber Dragon Orcus was actually objectively weaker. But the thing is, a lot of people were playing it. So whether you like it or not, a lot of people will top with it, obviously. If like, if we if we have like a 2000 man event with like 1999 Ojama, like Ojama decks and like one uh like i don't know adamantia deck then obviously the top 32 is going to be stacked with 31 ojamas but that's yep, not yep. because the deck is better it's just because everyone's playing it so obviously it's going to top mm -hmm. and it's just something that actually makes people very biased it's like they kind of they kind of like evaluate a deck based on how people act like based on how much it is uh, represented by people's actually choosing to play the deck instead of mm -hmm. like uh, seeing how it actually performs. Like Cyber Dragon Orcus had so many flaws and Luna Light Orcus was objectively just better. Like Luna Light mm -hmm. Orcus could not lose to Cyber Dragon Orcus. Like mm -hmm. absolutely not. Because all you had to do was literally just put one mega fleet in your extra deck and their, their entire board was actually already broken. And then you already have like a hand of six cards and a red eyes black dragon on your field, and then you can just kind of win from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was and that was weird because I was prepping myself for like Cyber Dragon Orcus that event that event as well. Like I packed, I think I decided like three system downs at that tournament because I was because I knew that that was kind of a sneak play at that point. But instead, you decided to go just full out Cyber Dragons, and you came a top eight. I know I gave you a big congratulations at the end of that event. What made you want to play Cyber Dragons for that event? Uh, like, when you when you take a look back at the three top performing decks, it was Orcist, 
Sky Striker and Salamangrate. So I think we can all agree that Cyber Dragon against Orcus, I really need to like put in the effort to lose because all their monsters are machine and the Galatea, which is the only card that actually um, turns on the Crescendo, which is the only card that can actually negate my core in like in a way that annoys me. It, it, I don't care because I can just set the core and then contact Fuse for Mega Fleet and you're already like behind. So I can just like super poly you, for example, while you're playing on your own turn and then that cuts you off from your resources because you don't have the time to make the Ingirsu yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I know I main decked super poly and I main decked Phantasme. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? I mean, just, yeah, Orcus just in general. I was playing like the perfect cards to counter it and mm -hmm. also cards that could counter Orcus weren't necessarily bad against uh, Sky Striker sometimes, but sometimes they were actually kind of bad. For example, like anti-graveyard related cards, uh, mm -hmm. like DD Crow could be okay, but I, I choose no, not to play like any hand traps. I actually, the only hand trap that I played isn't even like a hand trap. It's like Phantasme, which is like an upstart yep. goblin during my opponent's turn. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just had like a really good matchup against Orcus. I had borderline free matchup against sky striker because once again they all summon in the extra monster zone so mega fleet is a, like <laughs> is like the easiest answer and yeah. people once again are just not really prepared for pure cyber dragon so they either don't deck build well or they just don't play well like an, like a really another weird thing about this game is that regardless of how good you are if you don't know how to play against an like a certain deck that is not popular at all even if the deck is less good, you might actually still lose because you're not making the perfect decisions, even if you're a very, very good player. Because I played against extremely stacked players at Niagara. I was violent. Like, I want to say probably half of my YCS was against pro players. Like, my round three was already against Nishad Lorengo. Like, it, it's insane. Like, I, I literally started with very difficult rounds, and I was still <laughs> kind of winning because Nishad could have actually played better, but... It's just, uh, he didn't expect this at all. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the, there's that. And then Sal Salamangrit, I had to deck build to beat it. And I learned my lesson from Portland because Portland, like I told you, I lost twice against Salamangrit. So I was just like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. And it, it actually turned out to be better. I mean, actually Nishad played Salamangrit and I, and I beat him. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that. And then there were some other relatively rogue decks. Uh, I know I beat... Uh, Sorry, it was Danger Thunder Crusadia Orcist. Uh, this, I mean, I played against the same guy twice. That was actually very, 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 very rough. The top 32 <laughs> match was probably the hardest match of my entire life. My game three, I had to grind it out with like no super polys, no nothing through like a full, full board. It was actually really insane. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was just a really good match, man. Uh, Samuel Dang, if you're if you're listening to this, shout outs to you, my guy. But yeah, um, I don't know. I really, I'm, I'm so happy of actually choosing to play Cyber Dragon for that format. It was just really mm -hmm. correct, and it's that kind of deck that's really sleeper. Like I said, it's always going to be able to like just come out of nowhere and beat people because people are not prepared, and I am prepared. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing I liked about Cyber Dragon is that it's a really great deck for being able to break boards out of nowhere. So I find that I had to play a little bit differently against them because I the monster the monster I put up in the main monster zone, I had to make sure that that's the card I didn't care that would get lost. Because I for all intents and purposes, I knew that that card was going to get lost every time I played against Cyber Dragons. Like I knew it because the Mega Fleet was a card and I, I had no natural way to be able to stop that from happening. So it's, it really made me as a, as, as a player to really learn how to play differently against it and knowing that like my normal moves couldn't do the same. And I also played a lot of Salomon Grades too, so I know that you know the, uh, a protected Sunlight Wolf, a Soul Summon Sunlight Wolf with a Bailey's of Grave is nothing com against a Cyber Dragon deck. Yeah, it just gets contact fuse. Like, you can have Shizuku with a Ray in the grave. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Your Ray's not coming back. Yeah, so. exactly that. When you put, yeah. So that's why it was probably good a good matchup for you because you have that ability to use Mega, abuse Mega Fleet and then just go off on your opponent right there afterwards because it has so much uh, OTK capability to be able to wipe out your opponents. And it's funny you say that because the I, I want to say the trap version OTK is more often than the OTK version because the OTK version is so fixated on winning in one turn that it never actually wins because no. you're it's like a it's like a go big or go home kind of situation but it's yep. very ignorant because it's kind of considering your opponent has nothing to deal mm -hmm. with you it's yep. very like solitaire-ish. but with the, the trap version it's like I expect my opponent to have the nuts so I need to grind it out and then I'm going to win after that. 
and I actually end up winning very fast, like way faster than with the OTK mm-hmm. version. Mm-hmm. So, and I love that mentality, and that's the mentality I kind of used when I used to play Yu Gi Oh, like way back when, not so much now, but I would always let my opponents put everything on the table, I didn't care, and then I would have a deck be able to like break everything. Like for example, when I played Mono Mermails for the first time, that great that deck was fantastic at destroying yeah. boards. And I would let my opponents go all out and then I would destroy their boards afterwards. And then they'd be left with nothing while I have still a bunch of resources at my disposal. And then they'd be stuck doing nothing at that point. It feels like that's the same kind of logic and mentality that you have with Cyber Dragons. Let them put everything out, you beat them down, and now you have maybe like a plus three, plus four card advantage while they're top decking. Exactly. And the thing is, uh, another really cool thing is the mentality of letting your opponent do everything that they want and then you break them against mm-hmm. not letting them do anything, like hand trap them to death, mm-hmm. and then try to draw the nuts. So there are usually pros and cons to both, but the thing is, when you're like banking on hand trapping your opponent, mm-hmm. you're already filling up your deck with more inconsistent cards. Mm-hmm. Because the thing is, Ash is once per turn, so if you draw two or three, well, you're not in you're not doing well. Mm-hmm. If you get called by the grave or three tactical talents, then your hand trap was useless. Mm-hmm. And if you draw it for turn, your hand trap is once again useless. Mm-hmm. And if you draw hand traps that just do not match the what your opponent is doing, for example, if you draw Ash, but your opponent goes Anaconda to Dragoon, mm-hmm. you feel stupid because that, that hand trap could have just been like a forbidden drop. So mm-hmm. it's like... Uh, like just playing board breaking cards in a format that is not FTK oriented or hand loop oriented mm-hmm. or a format that doesn't make literally seven negates plus buster lock like Adamantia before mm-hmm. I think is usually just the correct thing to do mm-hmm. and we have like so many more cards now that are that are able to just break boards easily now like we have dark ruler no more we have forbidden droplets now and then if we really need to we have like we have tactics to really help us out too so we can really stray away from the hand traps now because if you, you let's say like you did use all your tra- hand traps successfully and let's say you use like two three hand traps a turn now all of a sudden you're starting your turn with two or three cards in your hand it's like can i really make a combo out of these two or three cards and if they are they've got to be exactly the cards i need and what are the odds of that actually happening as well so i can understand the flaw of, of hand traps and uh, playing too many of them yeah it's it's literally just trying to trying to live in a happy land like oh my god please please make me uh, please uh, i hope i draw three hand traps and my two card combo that beats you it's yeah. it's just it, it's dumb i i just don't i don't see how it is so like so spread out like everyone thinks like that but it's usually not even how it truly works mm-hmm. yeah there's a lot of the really good players can easily play through one two hand traps no problem and then they just keep extending and still build maybe not their optimum board but still a really good board that's still difficult to break and because i've already used you know two three hand traps just to try to even mitigate that board i may not have enough cards left over to be able to break the rest of that board as well yeah yeah exactly that's exactly it yeah you you yeah you said it yourself perfectly yeah. and, and again that, that's why like maybe people might main deck a uh, dark ruler no more because let's just play that three of that uh, three of that card and then that's kind of better than maybe playing like you know 10 12 hand traps that you're trying to swarm your opponent with because i played 15 hand traps including phantasm when i was playing salomon greats so i yeah. only, but, but only because they could get away with it because they only need like one card to be able to to get themselves going that's yeah, kind to of a certain ex- extent, yeah. Yeah, to a ex- certain extent, yeah, exactly that, to a certain extent. But, you know, but it's really tough, like, packing your hand with a lot of hand traps for that reason, especially if you're a combo-oriented deck. It's probably better for maybe if, like, a, a deck that's maybe a little bit better at control at that point in time rather than uh, rather than trying to OTK. Because, like, when you played your Cyber Dragon deck, you loaded it with so many trap cards. I think you loaded it with around, like, 19 trap cards. And, like, you were designed mm-hmm. to at least break the boards and then have a big backup at the end when you were ready to go for – when it came time for your opponent's turn. Because you knew that you weren't going to kill them, but you knew that you were just going to cripple them. Yeah, no, no, th- exactly. The goal is summon a monster, contact fuse for Mega Fleet, jump over possibly one monster, then go set five, pass. And then you have, like, you have lost two cards – I have a red eyes like dragon with five traps mm-hmm. and I can just easily like uh just put you in a really bad position if I go overflow and then strike on like something that is trying to negate me mm-hmm. and solemn strike is another one of those trap cards that it's like it's a trap card but it's it's insane going second mm-hmm. so it's not because a card is purple 
that it, it, it is slow or that is that it means that it's unplayable going second. That's also another culture that people have right now that is 100% incorrect. Like, Needle Ceiling plus Solemn Strike against five monsters is Exodia. And mm-hmm. people would still be like, nah, uh, just just nah. They, like, they don't even have any arguments. It's just like, mm-hmm. no, I disagree because because it's a trap card and and it's a trap card. It's mm-hmm. It's, yeah, I don't know. Well, the, that was one thing I wanted to mention is that when you have you have like so much protection behind you afterwards be- when you play all those trap cards because if I'm going first I'm not going to be siding in my lightning storms I'm not going to be siding if I had harpy's no. feather duster I'm not going to side in my heavy storm duster harpy's feather duster I wouldn't do any of that so, or maybe even twin twisters twin twisters I probably wouldn't even against cyber dragons so that mm-hmm. way like you know that if you're able to break the board. You have virtual five back row that are virtually going to protect you, and you know that they have no like natural out to be able to take them out, and they have to try to grind through it. But because if you just keep exchanging one for ones, you're going to win out in the end because you've already wiped out practically their entire board. You you just literally explained what is psychological deck building right now. It's like when you're basically deck building more against like a mentality. Like mm-hmm. I'm expecting my opponents not to actually have cards like that game one so <laughs> why not build my deck to beat whatever like people are deck building for mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's it you know, and that's and, and that's a big thing i think you like to the feature on your your youtube channel because you talk you talk about all these deck profiles and these combos that you put out there and that you put you put it on like quite often might i add so like mm-hmm. where do you come up with all, all these ideas and they like, and produce these videos honestly it's nothing serious uh it's it's usually just uh, ET Pat telling me like, can you break this deck? I'm going to make a combo and then I'm going to link your deck profile or combo video in the description so you get a shout out. So it's like a motivational drive for me because I'm like, oh, I get a reward if I can actually make something cool. So let's get into it. So we're just going to spend as much time as possible trying to either make a combo or try to make a nice deck. And I go on EU Pro Ignis. I pretty much start from scratch. I like just basically have like random ratios of everything. And then I start using the filter like, okay, this uh, like, uh, for example, filter, enter special summon. Mm, What cards are good for special summoning? Oh, this is interesting. Oh yeah, I remember this card. This card was actually uh, not too bad in that deck. Okay, I can actually try it out in this deck. And then, oh, wait, hold on. I just, I just thought of something. You see, it's like, uh, it's a combination of basically just uh, so many pro, um, like it's a huge process, honestly. Uh, But it, I think of it in parallel while I'm doing other things. So sometimes when I go for like a, a walk at the park, I'm also mm-hmm. thinking like, oh, wait, hold on. I can, I can do that for the deck. It's cool. It's mm-hmm. just like it comes out of nowhere. Like as funny as this may sound, my true Draco Metal Force combo, mm-hmm. I actually thought of it while I was sleeping at 2 a.m. out of mm-hmm. nowhere. It was just, <laughs> I didn't even know how to play the deck. And it was just like, hey, hold on. Rescue Rabbit Diagram and a Pendulum Monster is like five interruptions. I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was so funny. Yeah, I, I had a very similar experience with you. I, I was playing at uh, uh, an out of town local that I usually like top eight all the time. Like I, I usually crush everybody, but it was one of the very <laughs> few times that I didn't top eight. I was playing True Draco Invoked. And I was wondering, you know, what, what went wrong? Like, this wasn't my day or something like that. And then this idea just hit my head. And I'm thinking, why don't I, I... I thought of instant fusion and true Draco and Volt because it was such a good idea. Because, first of all, restrict taking a monster away. I can use Millenniumized Restricts if I want to, like, make easy passes with my diagram. Yeah. And then also it's tribute fodder if I really need to for, for a true Draco as well. So I thought it was it's such a good play. And I used it almost all the time. And it, and it got me a top at what... At, uh, at the regional top eight because it was my going second to true Draco deck. I always wanted to go second because I think those uh, pendulums were uh, were big at the time um, as well. I think it was like pendulum magicians, they were big. I think Zephyra pendulums were also big as well. Yeah. I went against a whole lot of them. And then and I was running uh, the Amato Iwato stun uh, true Draco as well. <laughs> and I See, decided that, to go away from it. That was hilarious because if you actually summoned the Mano Iwato against me when I was mm-hmm. playing the Metal Fools deck, I would just I would just laugh at your face because I my ending board didn't lose to Amano. I, I always had True King's return uh during your turn in order to tribute for Masterpiece. So mm-hmm. what I would do is I also would not summon Odd Eyes Vortex Dragon on my own turn. I was ending my turn with Odd Eyes Absolute. So I was tributing over Absolute and True King's Return to summon Masterpiece. And mm-hmm. then I was getting two effects. So I was getting True King's Return and Absolute to summon Vortex. And Vortex actually has an effect where it can bounce a, 
like an attack position monster when it's special seven. Mm -hmm. And then True King's Return was popping a monster. So it's kind of like I play around Dark Ruler too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there's nothing to Dark Ruler. And then by the time you get to Dark Ruler, well, you, lo you lost your entire board. So it's it was cool. Yeah, and it's 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 crazy now. A lot of like really good players now can can really learn how to play around those uh, those you know those those one card like killers like Dark Ruler no more. Just being able to play around it now, like like for instance that Warrior deck that's able to discard you know with Smoke Grenade able to discard any kind of hand trap or you know Dark Ruler no more out of your hand and you know that's it, it gets really tricky now nowadays to really play against those really good players who know how to like play around the cards even before you get a chance to play them. But the issue now is that since it has been like a it's like a standard combo almost. It's just everyone has access to the smoke grenade thing. And now hand looping your opponent is just it's by far one of the unhealthiest things out there yeah. alongside like FTKing because you're not even giving your opponent a chance and you're stealing information. So it's just unfair because even if like, uh, yeah, you can't really play it out. And when your opponent uses a card to like look at your hand, uh, it puts you in an even worse situation because if you lose that game one after you let your opponent look at your hand, you mm -hmm. might actually lose game two because now your opponent can actually side deck against you. And mm -hmm. that's another like another huge thing like when, when it comes to actually playing the game out is that um, sometimes your opponent goes like dolphin effect. You almost have to scoop because yeah. if they have if your hand is like not too great and your opponent has like one like any extender, you can just lose. And if your opponent goes connector into Dolphin, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty much game over from there. Yeah, it's like why they banned Trap Dust Shoot a long time ago because that's free information. And being able to know your opponent's hand and like play, play around it, play according to it, 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 it kind of makes the game unfair even on the first turn. And now, now we have like Awkward Dolphin and Smoke Grenade to kind of uh, be the new form of Trap Dust Shoot, if not worse. Yeah, they, then now, yeah, then there's also a, a pointer of the Red Lotus, which is also kind of dumb. Yes, because I, I, I won an OTS championship before this, uh, before the pandemic ended around March, and I was playing Spirals, and I, I dumped a Curious, I used Curious to dump a pointer, and then I used Nightmare Griffin to bring back the pointer, set it, and then I t ripped away my opponent's Dark Ruler no more right out of their hand that they were yeah. planning to use on me first turn. Like I didn't even give them a chance. Even though we grind, we actually grinded a little bit because he's he was able to sphere mode me the next turn anyway. But still, like I <laughs> like we grinded out. But you know that that's the kind of card that really like puts the game at a disadvantage. It kind of sucks that we kind of have this game where like the game's over even before you even get to do your first turn. Yeah, exactly. And this is why deck building is just like stronger than execution right now in Yu-Gi-Oh. It's not like Goat format where. Deck building was, I mean, yeah, deck building was important, but the thing is, deck lists were all like almost very similar. So net decking was almost like considered normal, and it was just like try to be like the best gold player out there. But now it's just uh, try to have the better deck in the room. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it's weird that we've kind of seen this evolution of like the de deck building is like so key nowadays as before like it wasn't too bad because the game was a little bit slower you had a little bit more leniency in you know making maybe making a mistake here and there but now that turns are done so quick sorry games are done so quickly every turn has to be very precise and you need to have every single card at the right moment in order to be able to win right now yeah it's not the it's not the healthiest uh dynamic I, i'm not a big fan honestly no. i hope things change for the best <laughs> I, I hope so too because i really like playing games that you know that have a couple turns in between for each player like i don't have a problem with otks i do have a problem with like the turns if the game's over on the first or second turn like i want maybe like three or four turns each on each side before we determine what when the game is over yeah, I mean it's it's more fun for everyone. It's interactive. It's and also you can't even say, uh, oh well, yeah, j just play Altergeist and stuff like that. That's not even interactive. That's like, oh, I like I interrupt you four times and then I resolve Faker into Melusik and then oh, that that's it. OTK. <laughs> it's it's dumb because a single Faker that resolves is basically already OTK. So it's kind of like you're playing a combo deck that is disguised under like purple cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's know. almost and it almost kind of acts like a pseudo floodgate because like you know that uh, the, that multi fair can fake can basically take away practically Still. any play that you're that you're trying to do, and then once they if they have that out there, well then it's over, and then it's almost always they're always going to have multi faker in their hand, especially at three and when the mellow C can immediately link some to link Rebo or or whatever or link Rebo whatever they need to do to get to the graveyard. It's it's so hard not to have multi faker in your hand first turn. 
Yeah, and it's it's yeah, and I want to say it's the control deck that I hit the most probably alongside Guru because the thing is, it, when you lose to a deck like that, you're like in a really bad mood because usually those guys they they draw like Pot of Extravagance, Hidden City, and three Floodgates or like one Floodgate, a Hand Trap, and stuff like that. But then when you play the deck, you draw like two Fiendus, two mm-hmm. like Final Battle. <laughs> yeah. Numeron calling if you're playing the Numeron cards yeah. and like I don't know like Umas tricks if you play that mm-hmm. and you're just like uh, is that even a hand <laughs> why, why do my opponents draw good and I draw bad it's just there's just so much really bad variance in the kind of hands that you can draw on those hands that you might as well just play a combo deck or like an actual very consistent and better like control deck like Salamangrade and Sky Striker. Like even after the hit, I think Sky Striker the way they are right now, mm-hmm. it's not that bad. Because at least they're getting everything back to three, except Engage, of course. Yes, which is the card that kind of put them uh really over the <laughs> which is the card that put them over the top. And it was also yeah. a pinnacle card in the expansions of other decks as well because before it got banned we were seeing striker in almost every single deck but that was just because the striker engine itself was so strong we saw it in orcas i even saw it at trains at the toronto regionals that we, yes. we, we saw each other at which is so weird like we're seeing it everything so i can understand why that card had to go but the, you know the striker it's deck itself now isn't too bad to deal with because it you know it's it, it's a lot more fair control i find yeah yeah, it, it, it's also the kind of deck where you can't just be like, oh, he has five cards in hand, uh, or like whatever, three cards in hand uh, this time. Okay, it's it's not like he could end with five back row and five in hand. But with Engage, like he could go from being from having nothing to all of a sudden having a full back row and a full hand. It was yes. just like the frustration aspect of Engage was insane. And you couldn't even justify it by saying, oh yeah, but uh, just limit it. Because no, you just search it with Shizuku and then recycle it 10 billion times with Kigari. So yeah. like one copy is enough to ruin people's day. Yeah, and that was one of... Like the feelings I hated the most when it was around was knowing that my opponent had it engaged and three spells in the graveyard and I had nothing to stop it. That was the one thing that just really irritated me because I hated that plus one. It always gave your opponent and a searchable card on top of that too, which was, I mean, I had fun always doing it against my opponent, but it was never, <laughs> never fun when it happened against to you. You always have fun seeing your opponent uh, opponent suffer, but when you suffer, it's it's never fun. It, it's never as fun, you know. But I mean, mm. but there are like good wins and then there are bad wins that you have. Like I mean, yeah. Like for instance, when like when you and I played, every single loss that I had to you were good losses because we actually we had real Same. games. We had real games because we actually played each other. It wasn't done with done within one turn. We actually mm-hmm. it could have gone either way. It w- it came down to maybe the luck of the draw or who was the better player at that time. Yeah, it it was very interactive. Yeah, I I remember, and the thing is, both of us played three different decks. Actually, it was Inferno against Zodiac, and then Chu Draco against Chu Draco, a Chu Draco Trickstar, sorry, against Chu Draco Invoked, and then it was Cyber Dragons against Sky Striker. So it was always very, it was pretty fair, like every time. Yeah, it it was, and it was, it could have gone either way for both of us in in all three of those matches, and I, I, and even though I lost the first two, I still had a great time playing you, and I'm glad that you also did well in those events when you beat me there. (laughs) Hopefully, I lose the, I lose the next one, so we'll be completely even, two two. Completely even, all right. Yeah, but uh, (laughs) it's all for naught though. If I don't win, if I don't uh, top the event though, I kind of feel bad. It's like, man, I took, I took away from, I took away a win from Yasin, and I know he can top. Nah, 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 nah. You, you are more capable of me. You have more experience. Huh? <laughs> more experience. Oh man, I haven't. I have not played. I've played like maybe once or twice since this whole pandemic happened. I've been able. Yeah. I've been. I haven't been able to really touch cards. But now that, uh, now that we're back into it, I can touch cards a little bit more now, and I'm. I can finally start building a deck. Finally, I don't have a. I don't have a deck yet, but I have. I have cards, and I have like staples. Like at least I have. I have my droplets, and I have my triple tactics and whatnot. So I at least have that. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have stuff that I don't even have. I don't. I didn't even touch a card since uh, February, I think, or March. Oh, uh, I don't. I don't even have the new cards like Anaconda, Needle Fiber, Ultra Rare, Cyber Dragon, Cybernetic Overflow. I have n- nothing. I didn't get a single card, literally. Oh, really? Okay, so yeah, I'm definitely way ahead of you because I have at least all of that. Like, like I have like my own Anaconda and I have my own like uh, Needle Fiber. So th- thankfully, I've got that. Thankfully, you know, working at a, I work at a card shop too as uh, my part time job as well as my journalism. Ooh. So. So you know, I have access to cards if I need to. Thankfully, and, and it's 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 nice to have. It's a it's a nice little privilege I have. Yeah, yeah and no, I feel you. It's <laughs> it, it is it is pretty nice. But I you know I have a sponsor, so at any time if I really need to play a deck, I can just uh, ask him. But I don't want to ask him when I'm not even planning to play anything. Okay, where's uh, who's your sponsor by the way? 
Uh, David uh, from Card Brawlers. Oh, from Card Brawlers. Where, where's that located? Uh, right now he's actually working on getting like a physical store, but he he basically has it. Uh, it's going to be. Uh, is it downtown Montreal? No, it's in the east of the island of Montreal. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were, yeah. I mean, it, it's. I don't think it's too close to where everyone else is playing, like Carta Magica, mm-hmm. uh, Gamekeeper, Fasa Fasa. I, I think you you've heard of these locals at least, right? Yes, of course, because I've I, I myself have played in uh, Montreal several times before, both at the local scene and the regional scene. Uh, funny enough, right. the the first regional I ever won, like top date, was actually in Montreal. Funny enough, what, what? Real, really? Was, yeah, this but this was back in two thousand seven. <laughs> My first regional win wasn't in Montreal; it was in Ottawa. That's funny it's too. Ottawa? Oh yeah, it's. Really quick story. I'm going to be very quick about this because it's, yeah, yeah. it's not my show. But uh, my parents it's asked me about show. <laughs> well, my show. I'm not the star here. But to put it quickly, my parents asked me if I wanted to go to Montreal for Thanksgiving because I have a lot of family in Montreal. So mm. I, I, I said yes. I found out that uh, Carta Magica was 15 minutes away from uh, where my family was, where we were staying, where my family's house. So I went to the regional and out of nowhere, like I couldn't top Toronto regionals. I think I played like three Toronto regionals and a and a Shonen Jump Championship a while before. And I was like a perennial loser. I was like mid pack. I'd have like maybe like six and three record, like five and two record, something like that around the regionals. And all of a sudden, I come out, I win first place at Montreal regionals. I was running Diamond Dude Turbo at the time. Yes, it, it, was, it was pretty. It was a pretty cool experience. So yes, I'm quite familiar with uh, with Montreal Meta because I have a lot of friends there too, including yourself. So I'm yeah, yeah I'm quite familiar with it. I, I was there last year on a business trip and didn't realize a regional was going on when I was there at the time, although my girlfriend would have been mad at me if I did because I was there covering it. I was there covering an event and you told me, no, I'm away in why I'm away in Portland for YCS. I'm like, Oh no. I'm like, yeah, that day, like, was the way yes, I was in there. That's true. That was a regional that I completely missed. Yep. 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 Yeah, because you were in Portland and that was the time where I wanted to hang out with you because that was my one free day. I'm like, just seem like, let's, let's do something. Like, oh, sure. I was like, sorry, brother. I'm in Portland. 100% like, oh. remember. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, and man. That was a funny. That was a funny moment. I went to Carta. I went to Carta later that day, and um, Dominique Lacay was there. He was working, and he, he told me, like, "Oh, did you come from the regional?" I'm like, "No, like my regional's next week." It's like, it was like, "No, no, no." There's a there's a Montreal regional happening right now. Did you come from that? I'm like, oh shoot, then no. I didn't oh even know my the regional happened. <laughs> and like my eyes lit up, and like I looked at my girlfriend. I'm like, "Oh my god, I can't believe I missed a regional." She's like, "I would have been mad at you if you t- if you went to that regional anyway." I'm like, "Oh, but still." Because hey, I had my girlfriend, Yu Gi Oh. Because I had my Yu Gi Oh cards with me anyway. Like I was ready to go play regional anyway, but I wasn't like expecting it. But I had of my course. cards anyway with me. But it's like, you oh, I could have played. I could have played. <laughs> it's just a funny thought. That's all. It, it was just like. Half good Salomon great deck. I probably would have. I, I probably would have had to update it before I took it on. But, yeah. but still, like just missing a regional when you're in town, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe I forgot about that. Or I didn't like know about it. Out. Yeah, yeah. But honestly, I think every regional in the past, like almost like full year, I didn't even <laughs> try to like do well. <laughs> I just no. went there just like for the experience with my friends, mm-hmm. and uh, like the most important thing was just like on the way back when we went to like eat burgers at the restaurant after that. I didn't even care about playing the cards. I just wanted to see friends and like eat burgers. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you, cause from Montreal to Toronto where you're from Montreal is where you're from for people who yeah, don't it's... know. Uh, it's, it's roughly about a five, five and a half hour drive to Toronto. Exactly. From where you are. So you're traveling long ways just to get to a regional. I know that you take a hotel sometimes and you, and yep. you were like dead the last time I saw you at a Toronto <laughs> regional. Because <laughs> I think you'd had very little sleep at that time. Oh, oh I, we never have sleep, man. We're so uh, undisciplined in our, in our in our group. Oh my god, it's 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 bad. I think it's almost every group where you just don't ever have enough sleep for when you're playing like a regional or bit or higher. But it's funny because experience. it's funny because we actually are aware that we're going to like not have enough sleep, and we're just like, eh, whatever. We're just gonna eat at the Cheesecake Factory and come back home at like three a.m. Oh, we have to wake up at like seven. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, that's the only time where I, I'm willing to wake up early. I'm not a morning person. I hate waking up early. I like to sleep until about like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. That's when I Welcome like to, to the club. start getting up. But regionals is the exception to the rule where I'm ready to wake up at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and say, and I'm pumped and I'm not sleeping. I'm like, all right, let's, let's do this. Let's play Yu-Gi-Oh. Yep. Like I get excited at 
5 a.m. in the morning. I never thought I would say that aside from you, Gail. You know what? I don't think I feel any excitement before I get to a certain round. Well, (laughs) no, no. The the main excitement isn't to, like, play cards. It's just to see friends that I haven't seen in a while. Honestly, it's it's literally just that. But then it becomes, like, okay, I'm currently 5-0. Every round is intense. Every every round gets you that insane trembling feeling. Like, especially when you're like four, four oh, five oh. When you're like only two or three oh, it's kind of like whatever. It's just another round. But mm-hmm. when you're getting closer to that goal, you're like, oh my god, let's win. Let's win. Let's win. When you're yeah. like seven oh, you almost have like a fail safe. You can like you can be like, oh okay, okay, I can lose. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I either did well or I, I even have like a guaranteed top, but it, mm-hmm. it's cool regardless. Man, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think I told you this, but I think you know what happened. But uh, you brought down your friend uh, Mustafa for, for one of the regionals. It was the December regional. Yeah, you played him. <laughs> yeah, and I had to play him last round, too, and both of us were on the bubble. And it wasn't that, like, I, I, I'm not upset at, upset at him at all one bit, but I didn't draw a single Orcus monster both games. And we were deck checked. <laughs> We're playing Orcus mirror match. Neither we were deck checked, and then I don't know. Maybe I just didn't shuffle well enough or something. But I didn't draw a single Orcus card. I'm like, oh my god. Oh <laughs> I my wouldn't even accept a win like this. I'd be like, oh, that, that, what is this, man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was laughing about it at the end, and I, I, I gave him a handshake and everything like that. Like I was fine with him winning, but I'm like, I can't. But I'm just like, I can't believe I went out like this. This is not the way to go. I can't believe I lost like this. Yeah, I'm exactly. Like, <laughs> like I'd rather go down at least trying than just go down bricking because I don't I don't want that to be my excuse for why I lost. Exactly. At least draw a skeleton. Like you yeah. can't do anything, but at least it's an orcus. <laughs> yeah. At least give me something. Yeah, something because I always because I had double mind control in my head. I'm like I just oh need one orcus and I can start breaking his board. I'm like, no. Yeah. Oh, yep. Okay. I've I've lost this. Damn it. Mustafa's <laughs> Mustafa's gonna beat me. Uh, this is not good. And he oh, and his only loss that day was to a guy I beat uh, in in round four actually. So like I was I was confident knowing that I. I, could, I, I had it. Not that I was going to like have it in the bag, but I was confident that I could beat him. But yeah. unfortunately, I didn't really get a real chance of like, oh, man. So I got to I have to hark on you for that j- just for fun that you brought him <laughs> down here to, to, to ruin my ruin my top eight. But, it, but it's a funny uh, little laugh. I thought um, I just tell <laughs> Mustafa, what did you do? I'm going to have a I'm going to have another chat with Mustafa. after we're done with <laughs> He was a good guy, though. Like, I, I had no problem with him. And like I enjoyed talking to him and, and playing him when we did. And he was and he didn't play well for like, even though I had a bad hand. I still had some plays, but they weren't the greatest plays. And he just knew how to stop me at every turn, though. So yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm not I'm not trying to hark on him on any way, shape or form. But it's just like, ah, uh, I just wish it didn't like go out like that. I would have been more satisfied if he beat me outright because we both had good hands rather than just me just like not having a great hand yeah exactly it's it's always better to at least go down fighting as you said yeah uh, that's what it is but but i know like there's i know you guys like to travel a lot and like let's say you travel to portland you travel to niagara you travel to pittsburgh for the for the nawcq man so uh, what's next for you now um in the world of Yu-Gi-Oh? Okay, that's a really good question because the thing is, the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! is weird right now and cannot really be predicted. So at the current moment, my only goal is just growing the YouTube. But as soon as the virus is over and we get official YCS dates, uh, I'm going to try to grind every single YCS that I do not have to sacrifice any important days of school to go to. So if, for example, I have like an extremely important... like. Uh, they like regarding like an exam or something then whatever i'm just gonna skip that uh that one ycs but you know if it's just something irrelevant then whatever let's go to that ycs and mm-hmm. i just want because the thing is i feel like the more i play this game like every year i just improve on so many aspects that i feel like if 2019 was a year of revelation and like a year of like 180 Mm -hmm. 2020 was pretty decent because i started doing something new in Yu-Gi-Oh, which is yugi tubing Mm -hmm. then what is going to happen in 2021 you know Mm -hmm. if we get fans then maybe i'm going to be able to get uh even better than a top eight or something Mm -hmm. we never know maybe i'm going to revive back cyber dragon in like and make them even better than i ever ever did (laughs) i have one friend at my local who will play nothing but cyber dragon it's been his deck for like the past two three years ever since they got like relevant like we came up with core they came and then nastro mm-hmm. came out afterwards they haven't stopped playing cyber dragon it's it, it's really funny watching it go so i'll always have experience with cyber dragons but right now it's against the the otk version not uh not your version yeah yeah, yeah. but still yeah. i do have to thank him because his 
uh, playing against him really helped me learn how to play against you a little bit more when we had our, our third match together. When we have a third match, I don't think I was playing the version of Cyber Dragon that I started playing after. No, I think it was it was a little bit different at that point in time. Oh, uh, oh wait, hold on. I think I played actually... What Did I play Sky Striker or Cyber Dragon? Uh, I know no. I played that for so many regionals. Yeah, I didn't see you play any Strikers at all when we played an R match. I thought it was just a pure Cyber Dragon versus Striker match. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I remember like I remember like our one of our games. It was just the whole entire game was just locked down with goes and match. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm like, man, I had to play Sky Strikers with goes and match up the entire time, and that's yeah. really agonizing as a Sky Striker player to to get through that because yeah, I think really... I had to use I had to use like Panker Trops and like and. Uh, basically, Pankatross was like one of my big monsters I had to use just to basically beat over all your monsters, and that's how I had to at least get the win on you because I couldn't do anything else. Pankatross was actually the star of uh, it was the highlight of that uh, that match because I remember you were doing something really cool with it. You played the Dino Wrestler Field Spell, which was yes. so nice because it transformed Foolish Goods into like much more than just an upstart or just a card for Kagari. Actually, like started becoming like a really aggressive card going second, and you, I, I know you played going second, uh, Sky Striker. Yeah, that, that, that's what I. That was my mentality. Was because I, I typically don't win the die roll a whole, whole lot, and I don't. And again, I don't care if people set up the boards. I always try to build decks to that. Try to break other people's boards because you know it, it's really hard to stop somebody from really going full combo. So I'd rather build my deck to really just to break full combos instead. And then if they don't have full combo, well, then I'm in a much better position than I normally am because that's my mentality. Expect the worst, but hope for the best. 100%. Yeah, exactly that. And yeah, that's and the, the Dino Wrestling, uh, the World Dino Wrestling spell card was so useful so many times because it gave me a chance to just pop out panther traps at any, at any given notice that I needed to. And if I needed to get rid of it off the board, I had multi-roll or I would just set area zero. zero zero over top of it as well so exactly. I have easy ways to get rid of it it's not even a break like there's basically no reason not to play it because it adds like utility to a card that you're already playing so it's not like you have to just play three of that field spell and then you have to draw it no 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 not drawing it is arguably better than drawing it and if yep. you do try it well whatever because <laughs> it's just another special summon for pancratops yeah so. and, and that's uh, that's why i loved using that build unfortunately i didn't do as well as i would have liked at that event i lost to i lost a thunder dragon on time and i actually lost a ba uh the first round i don't know why i lost the ba it was just I, I was just overwhelmed with myself and i usually beat ba with that deck but that day i just didn't have it in me Mm. And uh, it was a weird day in Montreal for sure, for sure for me. But uh, I always enjoy all my trips to Montreal, and and I, I always love eating in Montreal as well. That's also a big thing I love doing. Uh, when I'm in yes, when yeah, I'm in town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think I was on like a, a Rue Saint Catherine. I think that's what it was. Where, <laughs> yeah, where you're like you're like where you're right downtown and. Uh, when I was down for my business trip in Montreal, like my girlfriend and I, we ate so many restaurants uh, on that strip alone because I, I just love eating all. I love eating all the food there in Montreal. And there's, and it's it's not set in stone yet, but there's a tiny, very tiny chance that I could move to Montreal come next year. Wow. Okay. Okay. For business purposes. Yeah, because the uh, because the the paper I work for is a is an indigenous residence that's just south of Montreal. Okay, so well, that, yeah, so that that's why I was in Montreal last year because I was covering like a big a lacrosse sports event that was there last year. So that's why I spent like a whole I spent like eleven days in Montreal, and then I spent like the last few days with my family, just just hanging out, eating a lot of food. They own sushi restaurants and they own Vietnamese restaurants, so they brought home a bunch of food and we just ate it like crazy and drank so much wine. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Could be the beginning of something huge, actually. Yeah, that's that, that's what I'm hoping because I know if I do get if I if in uh, if and when I do choose to move to Montreal, then I know that I have a bunch of friends there already, and I and I know like a good chunk of it already, and I know I'll have a good life if I live in Montreal. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. That means that means you and I have to hang out if if I do move. Oh, you already know it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you so you've seen like what's what about your YouTube channel now? What what are you gonna do next with it? Uh, I have an idea of like a series where it's like, what if X card came off the ban list? So basically I'm going to like choose, like, I'm going to like think of a card like Laval Volchain, for example, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be like, okay, with the current format, with the current card pool, this is what Yu-Gi-Oh would look like if we had one Laval Volchain. Mm -hmm. And then I would like showcase combos and like decks that already exist, like what they can do. Mm -hmm. So then when there's actually a ban list, instead of 
actually like starting back from scratch. We mm -hmm. have something to work on already. And it's cool because it's an idea that is 100% unexplored. Like right now, nobody has a series for something like that. Yeah. It, it, a big example of, of this one that I remember is when Summon Source was out and everybody was asking for needle, needle fiber, fiber to come out as well. So I, I always wondered what a format would be like if we had Needle Fiber and Summon Sorcerers at the same time because I think you could make a lot of crazy combos if those two were out together. <laughs> Imagine a format where, okay, we never had that in the TCG. Imagine Needle Fiber, Summon Sorceress, and Firewall Dragon, and Soul Charge at the same time in yeah. one format. Yeah, how ridiculous that would be. Because I like watching those, <laughs> I like watching those like one card combo videos that like turn out a big board afterwards. It's, it's like, for example, I learned how to, I learned the kind of OTK with Lady Debug and Salomon Grates, for example. And then there was, uh, yeah. And then there's the Draco Net, like one one card Draco Net combo. You, you would see that so, something like that too. But I like watching those kinds of videos to at least kind of see like the utility and like going from like nothing to uh, like something really big. It's really cool to see those ones, and I think that's kind of a, a similarity of how you're going to handle the, your next uh, YouTube series. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm just going to try to do something that people aren't really cons like thinking about right now because if i stagnate or if i just make videos that be, uh, that is just like too competitive because other people are doing it too i can't yeah. grow like beyond what i'm already at so mm -hmm. uh, man i really hope i get to see you at the uh, big events too when they, when they hey. come about man this i know this hey. pandemic has slowed down everybody not hey. just in not just in Yu-Gi-Oh, but in life and the careers as well so it, it, it can slow you down just like it can boost you up yeah, I mean, you know what? This I don't know if this podcast would have ever happened if it weren't for the pandemic. And you see, I I, I don't know if I would have more than two thousand subscribers if this pandemic never would have happened. Yeah, because you're producing a whole lot. You have a lot more time now, so you can produce a whole lot more videos and commit to your YouTube channel a lot more. I mean, like I said, it's the fact that I actually broke from that routine life that actually made me start doing YouTube seriously. Yeah, because what do you do for a living? Like, where do you work? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, right now I'm in an internship because I'm at school for software engineering, but right okay. now I'm working 40, 40 hours a week as a programmer in like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of CAE. No, I'm not. Okay. It's uh basically flight simulation uh, company. It's a uh, like multi, uh, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's actually a pretty huge thing. I don't know if you've also heard of uh, Bombardier. No, I have not. Okay, pretty much th those companies are like uh, airplane uh, companies and simulations and stuff like that. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I just be pretty much work there. It's just especially like internal for like, like our clients are uh, CAE employees. So basically I'm just assigning like front end and back end. So websites for like, uh, like other employees to use. And it's really nice, honestly. I really like it. The fact that we're working from home, like I said, makes the day go by like, smoother i'm just less tired more productive <laughs> i can actually afford to do things after i'm done my work for example right now we're doing this one hour 30 minute podcast <laughs> and i had like an eight hour day well i mean from nine to five thirty mm -hmm. and also after i'm done doing this podcast i'm gonna go to the gym and i'm going to make a video for tomorrow so you <laughs> see how a day can actually be much more productive now than it was before and this is why i'm so grateful for the coronavirus is because it is the the most blessed curse we could actually have it's <laughs> like out of all the bad things that can happen to you i think it's probably the best one like well yeah because it gave you a, it gave you a lot more time and it gave you a lot more time to really think about things and you know you wanted to break away from it because my girlfriend got really bored she can't play like video games for long periods of time she likes playing she likes playing them but she can't stay there for like eight hours a day play, playing them unlike i can so she needed to do something different and i think that's kind of the same for you like you can't do the same thing every single day yeah. like you have you have to be a little bit different here and there even though it's something fun you still want to change it up exactly yeah yeah, I mean, I I took up golf two months ago to 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 change things up a bit. So uh, so now I'm starting to golf like every week now, even though I'm not very good at it. But golf again, every yeah. week. Oh, okay, you're not playing around though. Golf every week is actually something. <laughs> it is because Monday's a cheap day, so I always go on the cheap day for myself. So that's why that's how I save my wallet and give be able to golf at the same time. How much is is it per day? Is it like around sixty bucks ish? Oh no, for oh well, at least not for me because at least I live in a small town. But I don't know okay. how it is anywhere else. But I I only have to pay on cheap days twenty five dollars. Uh, but for more like ex expensive days, I might have to pay like thirty thirty five dollars. Unless I want to pay for a cart, then it comes to like forty forty five dollars. Okay, that that's exactly what. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's. Yeah. 
Okay, well, that, that's actually pretty good that, for uh, for your town, actually, because in Montreal, pretty sure if you want to golf like very well, yeah. you're going to be spending over 50. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, yeah. And, and does that include a cart or no? Uh, the, I'm not too sure about the actual fares. I just remember that, honestly, it might actually be like 100-ish if you're like on a really bad day and if you actually want the cart. Oh, geez, yeah. See, I try not to use the carts when possible because I, I want to get a little more exercise and I have a little cart to push my golf club so I don't need a cart. So okay. I, yeah, so I, I try to be a little bit more budget conscious and uh, and try to walk it. So that way my legs will get a little more exercise than not just uh, yeah. riding a cart all day. But I mean, yeah. if you're doing it, yeah, if you're doing it just for like super just fun and like uh, as a kind of touristic uh, activity, then obviously yeah, cart is the way to go. But if you're actually doing it consistently, then I don't see the reason to do it. Yeah, for me, it's it's both ends. I want it for a little bit of exercise. And, I, and of course, it's fun too. And then I'm pretty sure this is something I'm going to do when I'm like 20, 30 years older than what I am now. <laughs> yeah. Because it's such an old man sport, but I, I I love playing it though. I have a lot of fun. It generates so much money. It's crazy. It, it does, it does. But oh, see. man, I, I really hope I get to see you again on these events because I, I miss Yu-Gi-Oh! J- just as much as you do, I, I, I'm sure. I, I really do, yeah. yeah. Honestly, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not like super impatient to play in this current format because it's, yeah. it's getting better-ish, but there's still work to do. Yeah, I agree with you on that one for sure. I mean, like, I, I didn't play at all, so when like during the pandemic. So when we saw like the Ad Emancipator, like Eldritch format, I'm like, Oh, I'm like, I'm kind of glad I'm stepping out of this because these are a lot of, these are a lot of like quick one turn kills here. I'm like, ah, that's not, <laughs> that's not a format. I, I like, nah. I really don't like those formats at all where yeah. like, where the game can be decided on one turn, at least like give me like a few turns to be able to play the game before you yeah. like, before you kill me. <laughs> It's like I don't mind you killing me. It's just let me let me breathe for five minutes and then yeah. kill me. Yeah, let me have a chance. Yeah, give me a chance to defend myself before you kill me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, Literally, it's a, honestly. it's a funny way of saying it, but that that's just how I feel. You know, I don't want to play a game where I just have to scoop in the first round. And I've done it many times before, where I've like looked at the board. I'm like, I don't think I can play out of this one, and I don't want to reveal what my deck is. So I'm just going to scoop and just play. You don't even want to be that kind of person, even on the other line, being the one FTKing your opponent. It's not even like a good feeling to win like that. No, it's not. The handshake is like super, like, it's it's not even like a firm handshake that people give right after that. It's just like, uh, yeah, good game, whatever. Good game, yeah. I I love giving handshakes, but I, if I win, I don't ever offer the handshake. I always let. My opponent offered because I feel like if I'm offering a handshake when I'm winning, yeah. I feel like I'm rubbing it in. So I would rather like, uh, let them offer it. But if every we, time I lose, I always offer the handshake. We, we we think the exact same way because when you're winning, it's like okay, uh, it, like it's kind of like reminding them that you won and that uh, you're kind of like um, I don't know, you were like in the driver's seat, but yeah, just, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 more humble when the loser offer, offers the handshake because it's like very good sportsmanship. Like, yeah, you know. it's exact. That's exactly how I feel. It's, it's the sportsmanship acts. Okay? If I lost, I'll take it and I'll shake my opponent's hand and say, good, good game. You know, but if I won, I don't want to extend it. Cause I feel like I'm rubbing it in their face. It's like, cause some people get like really salty after they lose. Some people get really frustrated. And I don't want to. And I feel like sometimes if you just offer a handshake at the wrong time, that could be an insult rather than like trying to be a display of sportsmanship. So that's why I don't offer a handshake when I win. Yeah. By the way, fun fun fact. I realized people are not too salty when they pl- they, they were not too salty when they played against my Cyber Dragon Trap version. If yeah. anything, even when people were losing, which <laughs> happened relatively often, but <laughs> that, that was such a cocky thing for me to say. Mm-hmm. But um, like they they were honestly like shaking my hand like genuinely, and they were like, "Very good game. I like your deck." And I was just like, "Yo, thank you so much." Like this yeah. is obviously like a, like a reason for me to keep doing what I'm doing. Yes. I mean, that's what I like. That's what I like from Yu-Gi-Oh! Was when you know, you know, players can can walk away from a good game, like from a good game, and like give a handshake afterwards. Because like, I know I've been on both sides. I've definitely like had rough games, but still given handshakes. And I've definitely been on like the other end of winning many games that they were just completely unfair. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, it's that, and, and I think sportsmanship's a big deal. And I've I've had my fair share of like terrible people that I've had to play against, even oh, with very man. poor sportsmanship. I think the last. Um, 
I mean, like the last two of my three, like Niagara Falls slash Toronto wise, I I got paired up against the same person, and he beat me both times. But he was such a jerk about it the entire way, both ways. I'm like, this, this guy's not a fun to play with. I'd but rather lose to a like, worse when time. they win and they're being like jerks. Yes, that's that's even worse, and I've had that experience before. And then thankfully, uh, one of my friends, John Wilkin, beat out that player in top cut. I'm like, thank God you beat him out because I don't like that guy one bit. <laughs> Now I can actually uh, look up that guy. Actually, <laughs> yeah, you can look. You can look it up later. It's it's, it's somewhere in there, or if, <laughs> if not, I can always just private message you the name. Yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna say it online. No, 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 no. It doesn't. Yeah, do <laughs> there. <laughs> my, my. <laughs> <laughs> you you seen my man? I I can't wait to come visit Montreal again because my girlfriend loves Montreal. First of all, we love like the food there. We love the culture there, and we just love like the sights. And I have a bunch of family up there, so. I, I like to make visits up there. So next time I come up to Montreal, man, I got to give you a ring, man. We got to do You're something. Beautiful. Yes, yes. I'm looking forward to it. All right, man. You seen, man? Any more shout outs you want to give before we uh, we leave today? Uh, shout outs to my sponsors, Card Brawlers. Shout outs to my parents for giving birth to me. Shout outs to my Uber driver. I don't have an Uber driver. Uh, shout outs to uh, you. <laughs> I was just spending like 10 minutes doing like irrelevant shout outs <laughs> no shout outs thank you so much for having me in here and uh, no I'm honestly looking forward to this uh, to the next time uh, we'll meet and uh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a it's gonna be oh, what, what's the what's the, the term it's gonna be a blast there yes yeah. it will be a blast yes sir know, and hopefully we'll have round four sometime in, in the near future as well Awesome, man. All right. Perfect. All right, man. That is Yassine Sali. is my good friend from Montreal. He is known as Yassine656 on YouTube, who has over 11,000 subscribers. If you haven't subbed to him yet, please do so. All the links to his social media will be down below so you can give it a view. That is Yassine Sali. Yassine, man, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me in here. Don't forget to like and subscribe. For more information, Check out the Gate Expectations podcast on YouTube, Facebook, Patreon, Twitter, and Spotify.